Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to a Tuesday edition of Coffee with Clergy. I hope you have your uh, coffee or drink ready. As I always say, I cannot drink coffee at this hour of noon. Um, but my guest for today is uh, Dr. Sarah Bunin Benor, who is on the West Coast. So she perhaps can drink coffee at this hour of uh, 9 a.m. where she is. And uh, Sarah and I both met because our children were in preschool together in Los Angeles, and uh, I got to know her both as a parent and a friend and an amazing teacher of Jewish language. And if you really, if you have a lot of time on your hands and you want to see something very inspiring, her child Ari just had a B'nai Mitzvah a few weeks ago, chanted Torah with an Egyptian trope, and wrote a midrash uh, where Ari was in conversation. Uh, Ari put themselves in lots of different people's shoes and it was really beautiful and inspiring. Uh, and I could tell how much she was inspired by her mother's work on the Jewish language. 
So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome Sarah here to our Coffee with Clergy and uh, to start by asking you how you got into this work and uh, how it has blossomed into many, many real world applications. Wow, uh, thanks for that wonderful introduction, Rebecca. And I love the fact that that introduction included my child. How often does that happen, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, how did I get into Jewish languages? Well, actually through klezmer music. I uh, was interested in klezmer music. There was a klezmer band at my bat mitzvah. And then I started, I played violin. So I took some klezmer violin lessons with the violinist from that band. And then I, uh, when I was in college, I was flipping through the course guide and saw a class that mentioned klezmer music about Yiddish culture. So I took that and then got interested in Yiddish. And then I was taking a class on romance languages and I saw in one of the encyclopedia articles mentions of Ladino, which I had heard of, and Judeo-Italian and Judeo-Portuguese, which I had never heard of. And I just got so excited thinking, oh my gosh, there are all these Jewish languages I've never heard of. I want to learn more. And then I decided this is what I want to do with my life. I want to study Jewish languages. So uh, here I am many years later uh, running this uh, organization called the Jewish Language Project, which is an initiative of Hebrew Union, Hebrew Union College where I teach. Great. So um, you, I know, have done a lot of work on all of the different ways that Jewish language is not just an academic study, but actually has so much resonance in our world. And I think um, many of us might not have noticed it were it not for this switch to a virtual world where we all started uh, to see on Zoom and Facebook and see the kind of interesting things that uh, Zoom closed captioning does to Hebrew words. Um, I think I said to you, when you're watching and you see the closed captioning, you don't want to laugh because you don't want your poor B'nai Mitzvah student to think you're laughing at them. But some of them are just so funny and so like out there, you know, Torah as terrorism um, that, that you can't help but laugh. And so how did you uh, decide to really, well, tell us a little bit about the project and how you decided to take that on. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's not just concerned about laughing at the bar about mitzvah student, but also at times when you're not supposed to be happy, like when they're talking about people who've died or people, they're doing a Misha um, Berach for people who are sick, right? And um, it, the problem is we are speaking Jewish English and Zoom and Facebook Live are transcribing English, right? And this is a great piece of evidence that the way we speak is distinct, right? It, it, it might not be classified as a separate language because it's mostly intelligible to people who don't speak Jewish English with the exception of these words that get botched in the auto transcription. And I first noticed this, I mean, I, I'd never had the captions on before, but somehow the, the setting was switched to automatically on um, a few weeks after my child's B'nai Mitzvah actually, and then then I happened to watch the captioning and I just, I thought it was fascinating. And I started taking notes and uh, that the image that you saw at the beginning came from that first day. I think it was in February when I was uh, just watching those captions. And then I realized, well, maybe I can help because I have, a, as part of my website, the Jewish language website, um, I have a dictionary of Jewish English. It's Hebrew, Yiddish, and other words that Jews use when speaking English, not just in North America, but also in the UK and South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, wherever Jews speak English, they have a distinctive way of speaking. And part of that is using a bunch of words from these other languages. And so I thought, wow, maybe I can just give my dictionary to tech companies and then they can improve their captions. Turns out it wasn't that simple. Uh, first of all, getting in touch with the tech companies was harder than I expected. I did get in contact with people from various tech companies. Uh, some of them wouldn't even talk to me directly just through the person that I happen to know who works there. But anyway, what I learned was the way these machines uh, do their auto transcripts is through machine learning. And the machines learn through people correcting the transcripts. They, they learn through big data, through taking sound files and the connected transcripts. And, and then, so if somebody wants to 
help, they can correct transcripts that are automatically generated and correct those Hebrew and Yiddish words. But anyway, as I was um, thinking about how I can help using my dictionary, I realized, well, we don't have pronunciations on there. And over, it's been there since online since 2013. Over the last eight years, we've gotten many requests from visitors to add those pronunciations, especially non-Jewish spouses of Jews and people who are converting to Judaism and people who work at Jewish institutions but don't have Jewish education themselves. And so I realized I really need to add those pronunciations, but I don't have the funding for it. So I decided to um, do a fundraising campaign. And so I enlisted some friends and colleagues to make a video about how it would be useful for them to have pronunciations in this dictionary. And um, we've already raised about almost $7,000. We're looking to raise another $2,000 or $3,000, and then we'll be able to add those pronunciations. I hope in the, in the next few months, they will be on that website. That seems like very, very important work. And I think especially in a community like Central, where we have so many people who didn't grow up Jude Jewish or came to their Judaism later in life, it can, you know, we say mazel tov, and we don't always think about whether or not everybody knows exactly what we mean or you know when we add in as you said our Jewish our Jewish English which I know is distinct maybe from other kinds of of Jewish languages um I remember when in the time we lived in LA you were working on your becoming from book and thinking about like what kinds of language you need to learn to assimilate into different communities and I know you've also done a project with camps um about the kinds of very strange uh, Jewish language that happens in camp. And so um, I'm wondering from your from your work, what you what kinds of things you found out and how people who sort of grew up assimilated into this Jewish English can be more conscious of the kinds of words that we use. Yeah, okay, wow. So uh, I guess I'll start with the camp part. Um, that was my book that came out last year called Hebrew Infusion, Language and Community at American Jewish Summer Camps with my colleagues, Jonathan Krasner and Sharon Avni. And for that book, actually, that was really fun. I got to visit 27 camps personally all around the country. And uh, I, I, I mean, I got to see how vibrant American Jewish life is. It's really amazing. And I, I started that project thinking, that I would visit camps of different denominations to see how people were speaking Jewish English differently. But then I realized, whoa, camps have a whole different kind of Jewish English. It's Hebrew infused English. It's There's so many Hebrew words that they use at camp for the locations at camp and the roles and the activities. So you might get a sentence like this. After the birkat, go to the teatron for pe'ulat erev and follow your madrichim there, right? And so these, these words, teatron theater or amphitheater, pilat Arab, activ evening activity, and madrichim, counselors, right? Why are they all in Hebrew? Well, it turns out to be a very interesting historical story and, um, and, and there are interesting tensions surrounding that because at some camps there is a concern that people will feel alienated by having so much Hebrew at the camp. Uh, and on the other side, people think this is so great. We're making a very distinctive Jewish environment and Hebrew is one way that we're doing that. Um, and one interesting tension that I found is about whether the camps are interested in fostering Hebrew language proficiency or fostering connection, to connection to Hebrew, but also connection to Israel and to uh, Jews around the world and to the camp itself. Uh, which turns out to be a very important practice in these camps. They want the campers to feel the, these connections, and Hebrew is one of the ways that they do that. Are, are Israelis very confused when they come to Jewish camp by the, I, I mean, I grew up going to Hebrew school, and so when I went to Jewish camp, I was like, look how many Hebrew words I know. I know how to say broom and bunk and lake, and that turns out not to be that useful outside of camp, but I'm just wondering if you talked to any Israelis and what they thought of this camp environment. 
Yeah. Well, it, at many camps, there are shlichim, emissaries from Israel, and they have a training seminar in Israel before they come to American camps. And one thing they do at this seminar is they basically learn camp Hebraized English. They learn how to use the Hebrew words in an American accent, right? And they, they learn mazel tov instead of mazal tov. And they learn how to say the chadar ochel instead of the chadar ochel, right? And, uh, or the chadar, which is a clipped form of dining hall, chadar ochel, that, that um, is quite common at, at American Jewish summer camps. And they learn songs in Hebrew, they learn the, the American tunes, and, and, and they're socialized to be part of that camp environment. Now, some camps actually want the Israeli staff members to speak Hebrew. Because like Ramah camps in particular, they want uh, more Hebrew at their camp and they see Israelis as a good source for bringing in that Hebrew. But most camps really don't want them to speak Hebrew too much. They want them to do Hebrew word of the day or, you know, put, put signs up about Hebrew slang around camp or fun facts about Israel that might include some Hebrew words, right? They're infusing camp with Hebrew and they're using is the Israeli staff members to help with that. And most of the Israelis that we talked to thought it was kind of funny. Um, they, they weren't concerned and, and they, they didn't get upset that these American Jews weren't learning real Israeli Hebrew. Um, but we do get that um, ideology really from Americans who say, well, if we're going to be teaching Hebrew, shouldn't we be teaching authentic Hebrew, real Hebrew? Um, and so it's very interesting because I think of the way that Americans, American Jews pronounce Hebrew as real Hebrew. It's just a different kind of Hebrew than Israeli Hebrew, right? And throughout history, wherever Jews have lived, they have used Hebrew for prayer and study, and they have incorporated some of those words into their many languages, right? So Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Greek, Judeo-Malayalam in Southern India, all of these languages have Hebrew words that come from the texts and also from transmission orally throughout the generations and the centuries. And we as American Jews are continuing that practice. We are using Hebrew, but there is also an additional source of our Hebrew use, which is modern Israeli spoken Hebrew. So it, it kind of changes the dynamic, the, the, the re-vernacularization of Hebrew in Israel changes the dynamic in how diaspora Jews use Hebrew and think about Hebrew, not only as a language of our liturgy and our sacred texts, but also as a, a spoken language that is spoken by almost half of the world's Jews. So interesting to think about like the way that the language evolved. And, and when I think about the, a lot of my rabbinic study was the Talmud, which is in Aramaic. And when people open the Talmud, if they don't know, they just think it's it's Hebrew because the letters look like Hebrew. And they sometimes they sound like Hebrew. And sometimes you're confused and you're like, why does that mean that in Aramaic and that in Hebrew? Um, but I know that, you know, sort of every country and tradition developed their own uh, kind of Jewish language and Jewish vernacular. And so you had talked to me a little bit about this Iranian Jewish language piece. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that because it's very interesting. Sure, yeah. So you mentioned Aramaic and that was the first diaspora Jewish language. When, when Jews were in exile in Babylonia and also in the Holy Land because of empire change, Aramaic was the vernacular, was the language that everyone spoke. But Jews spoke it in a distinctive way with words from Hebrew within their Aramaic, right? And then in the Persian Empire, Jews spoke Persian and various Iranian languages, but they wrote them in Hebrew letters and they also used Hebrew words and other distinctive features that maybe a, a kind of Jewish accent in various places, right? And throughout history, wherever Jews have lived, they have done that, they've spoken similarly to the non-Jews around them, but with distinctive Jewish linguistic features, including Hebrew words. And actually the two most famous or most well-known Jewish languages, Yiddish and Ladino, are actually exceptions to this. 
because they were maintained for many centuries away from the places where they originated. So you have Jews speaking a Germanic language in Slavic lands after they moved from Germany, right? And Jews who were expelled from Spain but maintain their Spanish language in Turkey and Greece. So those are kind of exceptions in the history of the diaspora, but Judeo-Arabic and uh, Judeo-Provencal in the south of France, the, these were the norm that the, usually where Jews lived, they spoke similarly to their non-Jewish neighbors with distinctive uh, Jewish features. Um, and we have some research on most of these languages, but we, we don't have that much research on contemporary Iranian Jewish languages. There is a lot of research on Judeo-Persian from the Middle Ages. There are many manuscripts written in that language, which is basically Persian in Hebrew letters. But we do not have much research on how the, the Jews of Shiraz or the Jews of Hamadan or Kashan, how they spoke their languages. And I say spoke because most of the Jews in Iran have picked up modern Farsi, Persian, uh, in the 20th century. Um, but there are still some elderly Jews who speak these endangered Iranian Jewish languages like Judeo Hamadani, Judeo Yazdi, Judeo Kashani, and, and we need to document them because they're very elderly and, and these languages are, are very distinct. People who speak Farsi don't understand these languages because it's actually a different branch of the Iranian language family than the Persian branch. So anyway, I, I think it's so important to document endangered languages before they go extinct, because who knows, maybe in a few generations, some of the descendants of these Iranian Jews will want to learn their great grandparents language. And if we don't document them now, it will be too late. So. I am working with people who uh, do this professionally at the Endangered Language Alliance in New York and at Wikitongues. Um, these are organizations that document endangered languages more generally. And I'm trying to, um, to encourage that kind of documentation work in the Iranian Jewish communities, especially in LA and New York. I, I was reading, I think it was in the New York Times, an article about the effort to preserve Native American languages and how the people who, you know, are the people who speak these languages are primarily elderly and the way in which they're being prioritized for vaccination so that, you know, God willing, they live very long lives and can pass this down. What kinds of, what, what are the ways in which you go about finding the people who speak these languages and then preserving the languages? Yeah, uh, well, I, I connected with some Iranian Jewish organizations and, and they sent out a message saying that we're looking for speakers of these languages and we found a bunch that way. And uh, now I'm working with uh, one woman who is a kind of a semi speaker, which is often how these things work. Someone who has a little bit of knowledge of the language gets interested in documenting the language and then works with uh, people who have a better knowledge of the language. And the way that it's documented is videos of, well, now videos, it used to be audio, right, um, of, of people who uh, speak the language just telling stories and being interviewed. And so you get all that language on video and then you can start analyzing it and talking to the speaker and saying, am I getting this grammatical rule right about how you conjugate that verb, you know, that kind of thing. Also, you ask them, there you do elicitations, you ask them, how do you say this, this and this? Um, and and then people write dictionaries and grammar books based on these materials. And in fact, I'm glad you mentioned Native American languages. Of course, many of them are endangered and um, some of them are not even spoken natively anymore at all. But there were some researchers, anthropologists or linguists who, who came into the communities in, let's say, the early 20th century or even before that, and, and did some research on the language. And some of these Native American communities are trying to revive the languages based on these records mm -hmm. and, 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 and getting community members really interested in the language of their great-great-grandparents 
and 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 trying to use it now as a spoken language. And so an example is the Miami tribe, the Miamia language. They have summer camps where you can learn the Miamia language now, and they infuse that language into the environment of the camp. They sing songs in that language, and they they learn words, and um, they have some immersive settings, but others are really more like the kind of Hebrew infusion that I was talking about that I found at summer camps. Wow, it's interesting to see all the parallels between different communities and, and how they're doing this work, and, and I think that leads to my next question, which is when you look at all of the different languages, do you see parallels to which kind of Hebrew words or themes come through as opposed to the vernacular language that people are using? Yeah, so it's, it's usually, well, many of the words are in the religious domain, as you might expect, words like Sukkah, lulav, etrog, schach, you know, you're going to need, you need to refer to these things that don't have names in the languages that you speak. But many of the words are not specifically in the religious domains. R words like afilu, meaning even, or um, kal v'chomer, all the more so, right? These kinds of words that might be common in our rabbinic texts are used in many Jewish languages around the world. Another common type is words for non-Jews, because often Jews were in a minority in a given place and often persecuted, and they needed a way to speak about their non-Jewish neighbors in a kind of secretive way. And so many of the words for non-Jews or for uh, non-Jewish religious leaders or non-Jewish prayer, non-Jewish places of worship, even cemeteries had Hebrew words. Also, another type is euphemism, words for bodily functions and um, sex and things that people are scared of, like death or even the word fear. Many Hebrew words are used in Jewish languages for those kinds of, of euphemisms. Uh, for example, in Judeo-Greek, the word for rear end is tachat like tuchis, right, which we have in Jewish English as well, tuchis, um, meaning under, but it also means rear end. And, and then the words for, the wor a word for breasts is rimonim, which means pomegranates, but it also is used euphemistically for breasts in Judeo-Greek. Good to see we all uh, are, are uh, working together on this, on this one and having the this is the same kind of conversations and you yeah can. oh wait and i'll just add to that that another project in the works um i've applied for a grant and i'll find out in a few months if i get it is to work with the people who are documenting these endangered jewish languages to create a database of hebrew words that are used in jewish languages mm -hmm. and also just what word do you use for um let's say candle lighting or what word do you use for sidur prayer book. And, and so then you'll be able to search in, you, you'll be able to search to see how this word is used in many different languages, or how does a specific word language refer to that particular referent? So, you know, to go back to sort of our original piece that we were talking about, how does, how do people uh, use language to start to feel like part of the community? How can we help people who are coming into Judaism maybe for the first time? But also I was thinking like Central is a reform synagogue. I, you belong to Yikar, which is a non-affiliated community and also to Beth Am, which is conservative. And how do we help people sort of, even Jews, it can be hard to move among communities. So what are some things that you have found that are the most helpful in terms of helping people understand this weird Hebrew, Judeo, English thing that we're, we're speaking? Well, I think one thing not to do is to completely get rid of these words, right? I mean, you might say we should just get rid of them because it's not welcoming. But I think it actually is welcoming. People who are new to Jewish communities or new to a particular subsection of a Jewish community find the language sometimes overwhelming, sometimes off-putting, but often endearing and 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 exciting. And I certainly found that in my research on newly Orthodox Jews uh, in my book, Becoming From How Newcomers Learn the Language and Culture of Orthodox Judaism, it wasn't 
off-putting. It, it didn't make people say, oh, I'm not going to join this community because there's too many Hebrew and Yiddish words that they're using. No, it made them want to learn it. And, and I guess what we need to do is provide more resources for people who want to learn these words. There is a good book uh, called From Speak, the First Dictionary of Yeshivish about <laughs> Orthodox Jewish English. And it's a dictionary. And um, and so people who that I met in my research w were often familiar with that book. And um, but I think we need more online resources because that's how people operate nowadays. And so my Jewish English lexicon is intended to help that, to help people who are new to certain communities to look up certain words. And and by adding the pronunciations, I think uh, it will be helpful for people to learn how to pronounce them. Like someone might get uh, an invitation to their friend's wedding that says the word chuppah on it, and they read C-H-U-P-P-A-H, and they think, what is that, chupa? You know, chupa? Like, they just don't know how to pronounce it, right? So that will be helpful. But I think in general, Jewish communities can um, use these words and then sometimes translate them because it can be overwhelming to be in a community where people are using many Hebrew words and you don't know what they're talking about, and by providing a translation, you can use the language and make people feel welcome. You can have your cake, your uga, and eat it too. <laughs> yeah, I think that's you know one of the things that is so interesting in if you uh, run in internal Jewish circles is like how much Hebrew should you have in services and versus how much English and and how much translating should you do and and all of those questions. We want people to feel to feel welcome in Jewish life. And then there are all these things that you don't even think about, right? If you saw the word skach, the covering for the sukkah printed somewhere, you would never get it right. And so understanding, right? Finding a way to help people also pronounce these words um, seems like a very a very worthy endeavor um, and, a, and a real uh, step forward in, in creating welcoming communities because you know we want people to feel comfortable and also not to feel embarrassed if they say chupa. Um, because that's how you might think to pronounce it if you if you saw it written that way, and so you you to to uh, you got to understand the of it all um, in in the in the Jewish language. So I'm gonna give you the last word here if you if you wanted to leave us with a with a message about about Jewish languages, or it doesn't have to be like a whole global message, but um, anything you feel like people should should try, should try to walk away with after this very fast chat. Yeah, I guess I would say the way that we as American Jews speak is not only a valid way of using Hebrew words with our American accent, but it's also a continuation of our history in diaspora throughout the centuries, that we are doing the same kinds of things that our ancestors have done in the Middle East and in Europe and in North Africa. And I, I hope that, um, that, that people can think of it that way and, and, think of, and think of the way that we're speaking as a respectful way, uh, a, res a way to be respected of, of speaking English. Um, and also we're, we're both integrating into society and maintaining our distinctiveness, right? Some American Jews speak primarily Yiddish. And, and they are maintaining their ancestral language, but they're not as integrated into the society around them, right? Most American Jews speak Jewish English, which means that we are both integrating into the society around us and also maintaining our distinctive Jewish identities and practices. So I really want to thank you so much for for being here with us and, and sharing with us. And for those who watch Central Services, and so, uh, we now have a closed captioning service that doesn't always get it right, but does a better job than the auto caption because it's an actual person. But uh, I think now people will have a better understanding of why it is so hard to get all of those closed captioning things uh, correct, but also of the really wide breadth of what, it, what Jewish language means. It's not just Hebrew or Yiddish or Ladino, but it's really wide and even the kind of interestingly weird uh, language we speak at camp is, is part of our Jewish language tradition. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who is watching us today. I'm gonna to put some more info in the chat about 
uh, Sarah's project so that everyone can read a little bit more about it and, and learn a little bit more about what she does. Although um, I see some people Googled and already found it and put it in the chat, but I will, I will stick it there as well. So thank you so much and have a great afternoon, everyone.